Good morning, church. Need the four eyes. Um, Good morning. It is so good that you are all here today and you were able to potentially be here today, right? It was a little rough getting here with the ice, and so we just are so glad to see you all. And um, it is good to be able to worship together with brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, We do not have many announcements today. Just a reminder of that yellow card in your pew, that if this is your first time here, that you'd fill it out and let us know that you um, have joined us today. But also so you can communicate anything you need to the office. That is a great place or a great way to do that. And then the only announcement we have is just um, a reminder or announcement that we have our winter blast coming up on February 1st. It's a Saturday. It's the first Saturday of February out at camp. It is only uh, a day. Uh, There's not going to be any overnight for that this year, but um, it's for families to come out to camp to spend a day um, having fun in the snow and playing games and just having a good family day. So um, if you would like to be part of that, make sure you let the office know so that we can plan for that. I just wanted to encourage us today, we've been in the book of Acts, um, and so I just wanted to encourage us as we um, consider who Christ is in our faith that he is the solid rock, he is the cornerstone of our faith. And so from Acts 4, verse um, 10 to uh, 12, sorry. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Christ Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was, was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And those are some good words for today as we begin our worship. Shall we pray? Father God, I love you, I praise you, and together here, uh, your brothers and, the brothers and sisters in Christ have come together to worship you, to, um, to discover who you would have us be in you. We pray, Father God, that you uh, would be amongst us, that you would lead us, um, that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear your word today, that it would not fall on, a, on deaf ears. We pray, Father God, that um, in everything that we do today, that you would be glorified and honored. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will stand, we're going to sing song number uh, 662 in your songbook, and we're going to sing three verses, and the words will be up on the screen, or you can pull out your book, Um, and we'll have a short introduction from the band, and we'll sing. Thank you. You may be seated. As the ushers are coming forward, and don't they look great? They're mini ushers. Um, but uh, it's a new year, and uh, your giving statements are going out. I think they're in the back. 
or they're in the mail. One of the two. Oh, man. Um, but, uh, but I hope you just reflect and uh, just think on what you gave. And, you know, I hope um, you feel that uh, God has used it. And when you come to this place, that you feel that God is uh, blessing our neighborhood because of our church and because of your giving. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time we can come together and worship, Lord. Even though the weather isn't that great, Lord, we still have come together to meet and to worship you. And uh, us being brothers in Christ, we know that you're here and your spirit is here. And it's still going to be just as meaningful, Lord. I pray that you'll use these gifts and ties for the betterment of your kingdom. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture today is from Acts chapter 14, starting in verse 21. Please turn in your Bibles with me. The return to Antioch in Syria. The the preacher, they preached the gospel in the city and won a large number of disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconom, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to their faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders to them in each church and with prayer and fasting come committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they have, had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God has, had done through them and how he had opened a door of of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. It's amazing to me, whenever anyone gets up to do a solo, we give them a round of applause, but when people read scripture, we don't. So let's give the ladies a round of applause. read all those words. <laughs> We're going to sing again. Uh, this is a, a song that maybe uh, is familiar to you, you've heard, but one maybe you haven't sung. And so I'm going to invite you uh, to sing these two verses. Uh, the band are going to accompany us. Lord, you know 
that we love you. We're going to have an introduction from the band and then we're going to sing these two verses straight the way through. Thank you. I'm going to invite the band if they'd like to come and join us. So I have been uh, challenged. Uh, Over the last uh, uh, month now, last four weeks or so, uh, about prayer. And um, as I've been challenged about this, I thought I would share that same challenge with you. Um, And uh, I'm reminded, when we come to pray, we use one word quite often. And that word is the word just. God, if you would just do this. Or God, if you could just make this happen. Or God, if you would just, you fill in whatever. And I want to challenge you with this word, just. To remove it from your prayer life vocabulary. 
Because I find when in my own life, when I use the word just in my prayer life, it's like I'm diminishing what God can do. I'm diminishing that God really desires to hear from us. And God desires to communicate with us. And, and so often when I use the word just, I, I have to stop my prayer because I'm thinking about it now, especially over the last four weeks. And I don't realize how many times I do it. How many times I diminish God's power, God's presence, by using the word just. As I was singing that last song, as we were, I hope you realize in those words, all of those words that we sang were proclamations. God, do this. When we fall, pick us up. Not, God, when we fall, if you would just do it for me, as in, well, if you feel like it. Or if it, if, if, if it fits in your time frame. If, God, you would just figure it out for me. I don't know about you, but I have a bigger God than that. I have a much bigger God. Well, at least I'm not the only one. That's good. Perfect. But we have a much bigger God than that. A God that can do so much more than our justs. And so I want to challenge you as we go to prayer. uh, Again, reminding you of all of the prayer requests and the names that are on the back of our bulletin. um, To remember those this week. Not just because they're on that... that, um, I know I said it on purpose. I said it on purpose, not just because they're on there, but because God wants to hear about our concerns. God is interested in every part of who we are and our beings. Uh, I'm with the boys right now. We're, we're beginning our, our devotions at the beginning of this year. And uh, the first two devotions have all been in the first two books of Genesis. Surprisingly, I know. But heard, and, and what I'm reminded of as I, I think about this understanding of prayer is that God was intentional about what he did. There was a question yesterday that, that, we, uh, that we were reading together and it was, if you were God, you remember this? If you were God, what would you have done differently? Which seemed like a silly question to start with, but then it made me stop. It made actually all three of us stop for a second and go, hmm, creation was so perfect. And God did such an amazing job that sometimes in my own life, I always think I can do it better. I always think I can do it better. And if I just had a chance. But realizing that God is bigger and greater than that. So as we go to pray together, we're going to take just a couple of moments. And uh, we're going to take some time to pray, not just because it's time in the, the service now to do that. Not just because it says pastoral prayer, but because it's important. But because it's important to come before the Lord, our Savior, our Heavenly Father, the Creator of the universe. And to come before Him and pray. So let's do that right now. God, we love you. And God, I want to thank you for who you are and for how you continue to show yourself, reveal yourself, reveal more things about who you are. And God, as we come before you, I pray that you would see us just where we are. Lord, you know the concerns. Lord, you know the concerns of the people that are in this room. Lord, today many, many who are watching online, uh, Lord, we pray that you would come and be close to us. Lord, we pray believing that through your spirit you can do amazing, amazing things. And as I was reminded this week about how amazingly perfect, amazingly perfect your creation was and still is, Lord, I'm amazed that you, the creator of the world, would send your son for us, would die for us, would rise again for us, that would leave your Holy Spirit with us. And Lord, I pray that you would be with the concerns of our hearts. 
those concerns that even for, for some, nobody else knows about. And Lord, I pray that as we come before you, as we kneel before you, as we open our lives to you, that you would speak into our very souls. Lord, this morning as we listen to your word, I pray, I pray that you would speak to us, that we will penetrate so deep, that we would be changed people, that we would know more of who you are. So Lord, we praise you today. Lord, I pray that you would be with this congregation. Thank you for all that you do in and through us. And Lord, even in spite of us, Lord, we give you all honor and all glory for who you are. Lord, be with us this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, we'll invite the junior soldiers to head out with Miss Cheryl. Did everybody feel prepared for winter today? It's kind of been a long wait, hasn't it? She finally made up her mind to show up with rain. That's confusing. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 14. And we're continuing uh, our study here in Acts. And we had a reminder last week, and we want to be reminded again today, that as we're studying the beginning of the church here, as we know it, we want to be reminded of the mission that Jesus gives in Acts 1.8. And it says this, Jesus says, But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes to you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So today we're continuing on a specific mission with two specific men, Paul and Barnabas. And they're doing just that. They're fulfilling this great commission of of going beyond Jerusalem and sharing the good news. So we have, we're in our first missionary journey and you might find it interesting this journey takes about two years and you see in the map and the picture starting in Antioch coming around and then coming back around to Antioch where we finish today in our scripture as well so in this two-year period and it's documented in Acts 13 and 14 so we have men on a mission to know God to make him known. Their mission is to share the truth, to share the good news. Uh, and here, this is your part. And this is your Sunday school answer. W- what good news are they sharing? Go. G- oh, that was not enthusiastic. Okay. What good news are they sharing? That's a little bit better, but we can work on that. Yes. They're talking about the Savior of the world, about our Savior, about the man who is bringing God's kingdom to earth. They're talking about a way of living and and loving and, and a way of life that is full of redemption, a way of life that would bring peace and joy and reconciliation. They brought a beautiful message. But the truth is, and we read it in our scripture today, That beautiful message is not always well received. I'm wondering if you've ever tried to reason with someone who's already made up their mind. Don't make eye contact with anybody. (laughs) I have to admit I might be this type of person occasionally. You're so sweet. No amen or anything. Okay. All right. But so convinced that I was right about something that I won't back down, that I'm just sticking to my argument. Uh, Do you know who else is like this? Three-year-olds. Yeah, and some two-year-olds as well. Uh, They're stubborn and they're convinced that they're right in their three-year-old mind. And in turn, you are wrong. If you ever have an opportunity to look at these, these memes on the internet of, you know, kids throwing tantrums for ridiculous reasons... That is an example of just, in their mind, they know the truth. And someone ate their corn dog, and they will never live again, you know? In these scenarios, and really what, what it reveals, even in this little human nature of a child, which is the same nature that we live with, it's this age-old conflict of who's right and who's wrong. Well, friends, there is a right and a wrong. There is a truth and there is falsehood. And we worship a God who is the moral law giver. 
He tells us what is right and wrong through his Holy Spirit, gives us discernment and understanding through his word. And with that, we're on a mission to speak, to share, to make known the truth, to be witnesses of the truth. So how did Paul and Barnabas do that? Look at verse 1 and 3 of chapter 14. You know what? We're going to read verses 1 through 7. We'll come back to that. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. So here they are, being witnesses, preaching the good news. And how did they do it? What did we just read in verse 1 and 3? They spoke effectively, and they spent time and spoke boldly. Think about that. They spent time witnessing, demonstrating, explaining, and living the truth of the gospel to the people they met in Iconium. Think about that. The gospel is the story of God's redemption plan, but it is how we live. And they spent time with them, telling them about Jesus and his death and his life and resurrection, living in a manner that exemplified the fruit of the spirit of joy and peace and love and self-control. And what happens when you spend time with people? You build a relationship And when you have a relationship, the truth can be received. Because what happens with the truth when you share the truth with people you don't have a relationship with? It's offensive. When you don't have a relationship with someone, the truth is offensive. It's like trying to explain to a three-year-old who's in the middle of a tantrum that their way of thinking is wrong. Friends, the truth is not always well-received at all. In fact, consider what happened in Iconium. Not only was it not well-received, they they faced a concerted effort to, to hurt, to disprove, to argue with, to stir up dissension amongst those who might believe. Look at verse 2. It says, But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. That's Paul and Barnabas. That sounds like what we heard last week in chapter 13, verse 50. It says, But the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. And herein lies the fact, in the midst of fulfilling the mission, and this was true for Paul and Barnabas, and it is and will be true for you and I, When we fulfill our mission to be a witness as those who are to speak the truth and to live the truth, we will face persecution. And friends, if we're not facing persecution, it makes me wonder if we are speaking truth at all. If we're living truth at all. Really, the ultimate question for us in these stories, these vignettes in in chapter 14, is are you fulfilling your mission to be a witness? I mean, first, is Jesus your Savior? And are you fulfilling that mission? And then second, how are you responding to persecution? How are you responding to opposition? You better believe that the devil is constantly trying to, to confuse and cause chaos. While we, believers, are trying to be witnesses of the gospel, the the good news, that life-saving, grace-giving 
news, Satan is using people and situations and miscommunications and diversions and distractions to hurt the witness of believers. In Iconium, it was a battlefield of the mind and, and of traditionalism. It says in verse 2 that the Jews who refused to believe, I mean, they could hear a message and just walk away like, mm, I, I'm not going for that. No, but instead they incite dissension. They stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. How do we stand up to those who refuse to believe and who purposely attempt to poison the mind of others? How about the next generation? How do we stand up for what is true in a loving and God-fearing and gentle, respectful way? The witness... That's you, that's me. Friends, we must be connected to God. More and more I have been aware of in this past year the helmet of salvation. We must put on our helmet of salvation. We must protect our minds. You need to know the gospel, to know the word of God, to be transformed by it, It is not just for you to know, but it's for your heart and for your defense. That you can be a witness in how you speak and how you live. We have a responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ to work out our salvation through knowing him. By spending time with God so that we are prepared for persecution. I'm sure we were all prepared for an ice storm today. Oh, (laughs) get prepared, (laughs) right? You buy the salt, you stay warm in your bed, you drain the water out of your basement. Sorry, (laughs) too fresh. (laughs) But we're prepared. So how can we be prepared for the spiritual warfare that is happening around us? You know, there's all kinds of ways that the world, that, that Satan will try and distract people from truth. He'll use good things to distract people from truth. Look at what happens in verses 8 through 20 in the next town that Paul and Barnabas go to. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Laconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, They tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He's shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops and their seasons. He's provided you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, where they'd just been, remember, and they won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. There's so much in this passage of scripture, and just reading it fresh in my mind, it makes me think, was Paul playing possum? Like, he's like, okay, just go in the fetal position, and you'll survive this, you know, being stoned to death. Or when they have this moment where the men are sacrificing to them, they're like, what in the world is happening? Well, something very clear is happening. 
the truth, they come in and they're welcomed, and it's even received, but it's absolutely misunderstood, distorted, and then attacked. And friends, this is always what will happen if and when we try and digest the truth of the gospel through the lens of culture. In the Laconian setting, Paul and Barnabas witnessed through a miracle. They did a miraculous sign. People got excited. And what was the first response? The people immediately and incorrectly assessed the situation through their cultural lens. And they begin to worship the messengers instead of the message. Now, unlike their visit to Iconium, where the battlefield was the mind, now they're facing the battle of pagan influences. In our own post-truth cultural world, we will always be facing pagan influences. But here's the truth about the gospel. It is built on Christ alone. There's no room for Zeus and Hermes. There's no room for idol worship, for legalism. There's no room for Jesus and. It is Christ alone. In fact, what happened to Paul? He was stoned and dragged out of the city. Are you prepared to speak truth like that in a world where the culture dictates everything? Are you prepared to stand up for the truth? Are you prepared to be persecuted for what you believe? In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Are you prepared to speak the truth? Are you prepared to face opposition? Are you, are you prepared for rejection? I'm wondering if we are prepared to be a witness at all. Or are we cocooned in, in our Christian culture, in our Christian circles, that we're just witnessing to ourselves? Now, most of you know me, and you know that by nature, I am really an optimist. <laughs> I like to see the, the bright side. I'm the, the glass half full. And if I'm not, Peter knows that I need a good reminder of who I am. <laughs> but usually, I see a situation, and I am automatically assuming, for example, that um, everyone's going to be open to having a dialogue about faith. Right? I can go talk to that person, that I'll say the words, you know, I'll speak the truth, and that everyone who hears them will be saved, that they're going to receive the good news I'm sharing, that it's going to be this beautiful kumbaya sort of moment. So, yes, I'm an optimist, but is that reality? No. Might it be better received in a relationship with people I've spent time with? Yes. But is that reality? We know the truth of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, who gives forgiveness and gives freedom and hope. And we need to be prepared, if anything, we need to be willing to speak. And friends, we must be prepared to recognize the confusion and the chaos of the devil. But don't lose heart because we have the tools to do this. The same tools we use for direction and discernment are what we use for, for clarity and for fortifying ourselves up to be witnesses. We pray, we fast, we worship, we spend time relying on the Holy Spirit. We spend time connecting to the Lord through his word and practicing solitude. These are all tools that we can use to develop, to fortify us for serving, for being a witness. 
Well, there were moments where Paul and Barnabas had to walk away. We know this happened in chapter, the, the end of chapter 13. He was stoned, and he left the town the next day in chapter 14. I think that was a wise, Holy Spirit-led decision. There are moments, like it says in 1351, where they shook the dust from their feet and walked away. And there will be moments where we need to walk away from people or situations or conversations in a grace-filled, gracious sort of way. But the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. I want to look at the verses that Harper and Mercy read for us again. Because this is a beautiful challenge for us. When it, how do you bear witness? How do you live as a witness? And I think the writer of Acts gives us some clarity here in verse 22 and 23. But we'll start in 21. They preached the good news in the city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. So think of that map. They're going back around. They returned, and verse 22, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And it says, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, and whom they had put their trust. Paul and Barnabas do something very specific here. Yes, they give... I don't know if it's encouragement. They share the honesty that believers are going to go through hardship. But what do they do? What are those key words they use here? They strengthen and they encourage one another to remain true to the faith. There is an accountability and an encouragement in the body of Christ. And that's how we maintain the opportunity and the ability to be a witness by strengthening one another, by encouraging one another. This word strengthening really just means to build up. And I just have this picture of coming around and building up and encouraging, which offers a kind of protection of its own. But while they're gathered with the body, they strengthen and they encourage They stay true to the faith. They pray. They fast. They commit to the Lord whom they trust. And for me, that just sounds like committing to a lifestyle of faith that is built on accountability and growth. Yeah, that was hard out there. They tried to kill me. (laughs) But he came back to the body. And they encouraged. And they grew. And they were reminded of the life-giving way of Jesus. Friends, our response to persecution, it is not about being more aggressive or about being argumentative or, Lord, help us, being mean. That's not allowed. It is to be committed to the community of believers that loves and prays and worships and speak the truth. Yeah, we witness to each other first. But we are called to go beyond Jerusalem. We're called to to connect in relationships outside of the body. To share the truth. We're called to be people like Jesus calls for in Matthew 5.44. When he says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The challenge for us today is simple from Paul and Barnabas and their example here. Are you a witness to the truth and are you prepared for opposition? As we take time to pray this morning, I really want you to think about those different three areas where Satan was using to attack in these different towns, that battlefield of your mind. People who were not excited about the truth started poisoning the mind of others around them. Or think about those who were anti-truth. It's because they were clinging so hard to their traditionalism. They had a fear that what they knew would be lost. And they poisoned the minds 
of others. I find it interesting that it was not just other Jews, it was Gentiles. These people who they might not have cared about, they're like, well, I don't want them to be Jesus followers either. So is your mind protected by the helmet of salvation? Are you putting on that armor of God every day to protect yourself from the spiritual warfare brought on by the devil? And then in Lystra, how is culture influencing the gospel in your life? This is a slippery, slippery slope. For looking at the gospel through the lens of culture will not reveal truth. The truth is found in Christ alone. Friends, I encourage you, as we continue in this series, as you even evaluate your own spiritual condition, are you prepared for opposition? And are you facing any persecution? No, then it's time to get out in the field and be a witness. I'm going to have Doug just play a song on the piano. It's familiar to all of us. Great is thy faithfulness. And we're not going to sing because I want to just take some concentrated time of prayer. Because to be honest, this might be your first time this week setting aside time to listen to the Lord. To talk with the Lord. But really evaluate. Lord, help me to be a witness. Lord, fortify me to stand up against persecution and to follow the will of your Holy Spirit. But don't miss the opportunity to take this time to rest in him, to know him, and to be challenged to be a witness. Let's pray together.
Heavenly Father, you are so good and faithful. And you are just. You are righteous and holy. And Father, we want to be witnesses of your truth. We want to be prepared to speak truth boldly, to tell others of your goodness and your graciousness and your saving grace. And Heavenly Father, this morning I pray for my brothers and sisters that they would know you, that they would be filled with your spirit, and that they would be challenged to be a witness with and without their words, Lord. That we might be living in a holy manner that is a witness to who you are. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are under attack by the devil. I pray that you would fortify them, that you would bring other believers alongside to support and to encourage. And Lord, that we would all be aware that the schemes of this world will not succeed. Lord, that you have had the victory and that we can stand on this truth as a solid foundation to live, to serve, to speak. Lord, that we would be witnesses for you. I pray for my brothers and sisters who aren't here today, Lord, who need to feel your presence. That they would open their eyes and recognize you. That they would feel your comfort and peace. And Lord, that they would be emboldened to be your witness. We love you and we praise you today. Amen. Amen. I invite everybody to stand. I feel like I should have you all move forward too for our last song. We're going to call this the Ice Sunday. And I'm going to invite the band to come back up. We have a great benediction of a song, I'll Stand for Christ. Dancing is allowed. Clapping, if you can find the right place to clap. That's encouraged or not. And we will claim this as our truth today, that we know Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that we can live and speak and sing for him. So let's make a joyful noise together, and we'll follow the direction of the band. Taken our stand to fight against the forces of sin, to the rescue we go. Satan's power to overthrow and his captives to Jesus will win. Amen. You got it. All right. We'll follow you later.
men. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.